serpent, the god of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. Thou shalt go unto my country, and to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son. And the servant said unto him, Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, And to thy seed will I give this lamb. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. All together, please. And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, master, and swear to him concerning that matter. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning, even for the times that we have already used to study your word. And as we continue to um, study your word uh, here in uh, Genesis chapter 24, may you help us realize to, and, uh, uh, to draw, help me draw the parallels, dear Lord, of this servant to us being a servant of uh, you, dear Lord, here in the church. I pray that you help us understand these words and that you may challenge us this morning, not only challenge us, dear Lord, but to remind us of our duty as servants of God and that we'll be able to glorify you and serve you better, not only you, but serve each other as well. And may you uh, be the one to be lifted up and may you be done to work in our hearts. For all these things, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, you may be seated. Thank you for standing with me. So uh, here in Genesis 24, um, uh, I would I or actually want to preach for the whole chapter, but instead I'll just preach until verse nine. Um, this um, I might make this a, a short series only in this one chapter, and the only reason why I do that is because every Sunday school we're allowed around an hour to preach, and we'll not be able to take to preach on all the things that I want to touch on here in Genesis 24. But we know the story. And uh, today I'm here in the capacity of uh, uh, substituting for a brother. I'm, that's why, uh, uh, but I will have a, a, an alternate every Sunday school. When I'm substituting for him, I know that he's uh, uh, it's going to be a father and it's very exciting times and I know the feeling. And, um, but I believe that as a token of his gratitude, he will not pass on tonight's basketball. Okay, amen. Praise the Lord. So uh, when uh, I've been uh, thinking on this chapter um, for since he told me that he might uh, ask me to sub for him, so I've been uh, reading on this chapter. And usually when I when I sit on uh, uh, sit and read the Bible, I let the Lord kind of lead me to a message that He wants to preach. Since I finished, uh, uh, since I stopped uh, preaching about Nehemiah, and and the Lord led me to this. I believe I was. Um, uh, reading one of the books of uh, David Cloud when it, and when it was uh, uh, brought to this chapter. No, no. No, I was studying about the sovereignty of God and also the uh, will of man. And when I came to this chapter and read the chapter, it's really a good chapter and tried to meditate upon it for a few days. And yesterday, uh, while our pastor was preaching and, and touched upon the, uh, us being a servant, it, uh, the Lord, I believe, has talked to my heart to really preach on this uh, matter. So I believe that every time I prepare uh, preaching, uh, if since I stopped preaching about Nehemiah, God always uh, confirms the message. I don't know why after the preaching every Saturday. So it's good to listen to that as well. And God confirms that message in my heart, and then work on it. Uh, actually, for uh, uh, of course the whole day of Saturday, meditate upon it. That's why it's good that us uh, men, God gave us the wisdom to adjust our schedule to Sunday instead. So, so that means we don't play every Saturday anymore, but we're going to play later. Amen? Amen. So now that I've got that out of the way, again, I have uh, put this uh, short series here in Genesis 24, but I, I want to uh, tackle about, talk about not only Abraham and Isaac, but the whole, the whole chapter talks about the servant and then the bride, Rebecca towards the end. And let's look at the attitudes that they have and the principles that we can learn from here. Let's, yesterday, we learned that we are all ministers of Christ. We learned from our, from our 
pastor, that we are all servants here in church. We are all in the capacity to serve one another, to serve God ultimately. That is our ultimate goal, to give glory to the Lord. But the point here is we're all servants of Christ here in the church. Now, no one here should have the attitude of, I'm here because I need to be served. Not even the preachers, especially not the pastor. If the pastor has the kind of attitude that I'm here, people need to do something for me every Sunday, then that pastor is playing God. The pastor himself is a minister of Christ. The pastor himself is someone who will feed the flock, and the flock will encourage each other, especially during every Sunday. Now, if, if, when we gather in church, when we are here, when we're worshiping the Lord, let us all have the mindset of being servants. We're not really serving the Lord right now we're worshiping him but we're all ministers of christ yesterday it was really it was taught to us that we are all ministers of christ and that we're all here to do something in the bible when you look at the uh, examples that especially paul gives to the uh, uh, the the church he always compares it to an, an organism something that works together he compares it, uh, he compares it to the body he compares it to a um, uh, husband husbandry plantation and, and and the point there that paul is always making especially to the people at corinth when he was writing to them is that the church functions as a whole everyone that christ plays in the church saved believers baptized believers in the church will have their own function and only it's, it's between you and god depending on the grace is going to give you the talent is going to give you or the ability is going to give you he wants you to use that in a serving capacity in the church that's why we all have that gift we all have something that god will use to serve to bless each other to encourage one another even encourage the leaders as well the leaders have that leadership quality to lead us towards more spiritual things but everyone here is not called to sit here every sunday not everyone uh, not not a single person that christ plays in the church is a sunday christian not a single person it should be only a weekend christian we should all do something that is uh, glorifying the lord and under the ministry of the church here now god places here to minister to one another and specifically god is calling us to do something for him mm. now it's you know what it is i don't know what it is god's calling you to do i don't uh, you know uh, i may know the main reason some of you came here in the first place but i believe that god has been working in your heart to do something for him specifically his will for you his calling for you because god called us to do something now uh, it may be uh, to be a preacher like, like what god called me to do to preach or to be to lead a church someday or maybe just to be a missionary but there's one calling that god has given to all of us one common calling and one common um what they call this command is to preach the gospel to every creature now that command is given to the church that command is not given only to the apostles that command is not given only to the pastors to the ministers but it is given to every single believer that christ has saved to every person who repented of their sin and placed their faith in christ your job our job our mission is to preach the gospel to every creature and that is something we must do faithfully now here in this uh, chapter we see as servants of god as ministers of god as we obey god as we try to faithfully obey that calling to preach the gospel to every creature we will encounter difficulties we will encounter um what they call this uh, hurdles that we have to go through and most of the time when you notice especially missionaries or people who are in the foreign field preaching the gospel whenever we encounter this difficulty there are different responses it's either you can keep on going and keep on faithfully preaching the word some stop right you get discouraged you just stop some stays in the middle and neither keeps on faithfully preaching gospel and they didn't stop but they compromise this is something that they do now it depends what are you going to do when you're faced with difficulty in preaching the gospel are you going to stop are you going to continue or are you going to compromise now these people who compromise live in a state of in their spiritual lives thinking that they're still obeying god but we don't realize that they're already far away from how god wants them to preach the gospel now um in in, in this instance we will see that in the bible even from the old testament to the new testament when god commands something and we want obey to obey the lord it's either you obey him the way he wants you to obey you or just don't obey him at all why because you'll be wasting your time remember joshua and caleb when god allowed them to uh, experience the promise the reason is simply because they wholly followed the lord 
without compromise, completely followed the Lord, obeyed every single word, obeyed everything. And those people or from their generation who compromised and doubted, they were not given the promise. They were not given, uh, allowed to experience the promise. But these two people were allowed because the Bible says, exact words, wholly followed the Lord. And that is something that we need to do as servants of God. We need to wholly follow the Lord. Not pick and choose what we want to follow. Not pick and choose what is convenient for us. But we follow the Lord whether it's convenient or not, comfortable or not, easy or not. Our job is to faithfully follow the Lord. And here in this uh, account, we see here that in verse 1, um, Abraham, the Bible says, and Abraham was old. And we'll try to make uh, a parallels towards this and also uh, uh, our job as uh, 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 preachers of the gospel. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. We hear that Abraham was an old man during this time. I believe Sarah had died already uh, during this time. And Abraham was worried here, we have read it, that Isaac will either, he will not, it's either he will not exp uh, uh, witness Isaac getting married or he will witness Isaac getting married to the wrong woman. He's to, to get married to an, a Canaanite. And, and, and Abraham knows the, 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 the disaster that will happen when, it ha when, when, when he does do that. Now, the job that Abraham gave to his servant here was to find a wife for Isaac. Now, we know the story of Isaac. And if you're studying uh, Old Testament, Isaac is a type of Christ. Now, uh, remember that when Isaac was about to be offered by Abraham, one thing that we overlook here is that Isaac was willing to be sacrificed. Now, I'm sure that uh, I'm sure that uh, somewhere along the way, Isaac realized, I am the sacrifice. You know the story, right? There's no sacrifice. It's only bringing uh, the things for sacrifice, but no uh, 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 specific uh, um, animal to sacrifice. I'm sure Isaac realized, it's me. And I'm sure that he realized definitely when he was being bound by his father. But we don't see any struggle in the story. We don't see anything, uh, Isaac saying, oh, why are you doing this to me? You, you, you're not, you cannot sacrifice me. I'm your only son. You cannot kill me. You're, you're, you're about to kill me. You're about to sacrifice me to God. But Isaac didn't do that. Why? Well, it's the same way in the parallel that Christ was willing to lay his life for us. Right? He, nobody killed Christ. Nobody took his life from Christ. Christ was willing to lay his life for us. He is the only begotten Son of God, and He's willing to sacrifice and to do that for us. So in a way, Isaac is a type of Christ. Now the servant here, by implication, is a type of the believers. Why? Because Abraham is asking the servant to find a wife for Isaac. Now what is our job today? To preach the gospel, to get people saved, to help uh, to, to be the, uh, a way for the Holy Spirit to get people saved. In a way, we're calling a bride for Christ. Right? The bride of Christ, contrary to some, uh, what some Baptists believe, are people who are saved. Baptists or not, they're going to be married to Christ. So in a way, we're calling wife, the, uh, wife, the wife of Christ to present it uh, uh, to Christ someday. And these people who are saved by the blood of Christ are going to be married to Christ someday. So this servant, in a way, is a type of us. We are commanded to do that, to go and, and, to go and preach the gospel to every creature. And someday these people are, will be the people who will be married to Christ. Now, what is the instruction of Abraham uh, here in verse number 2 to 4? The point number one here is, uh, let's read the verse four, the, the verse two to four first. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord God of heaven and the God of earth that thou shalt uh, not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of Canaanites among whom I dwell, but thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. Now point number one here is taken in verse number two. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had. Abraham, first point, gave the mission to most, his most trusted servant. Now we have to take that into account. Abraham gave the mission to his most trusted servant. This servant, though he's not named in this chapter, is probably Eliezer. That the servant who, who uh, uh, parabang siya yung leader ng mga servants. Now, in Genesis 15 too, it says, And Abraham said, Lord God, Genesis chapter 15 verse 2, What wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. So it, uh, Abraham is talking to him. Now, Abraham will not give him 
a, a, a rule over his house or, or the steward or, or the responsibility over his house if he's not a trusted person. And the importance of this mission, calling a wife for Isaac, for Isaac is very important to Abraham that he gave it to his most trusted servant. To a person who he knows he can trust. To a person he who knows will do his best in order to carry out this, uh, uh, this mission that is given. In the same way, yes, we are all called to evangelize. Yes, we are called to preach the gospel. But we have to realize that God entrusts more to people who have been faithful to him. If you want God to, 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 to call you or to, uh, to use you in a bigger capacity to serve him, Make sure that you're faithfully doing what he's, called, what he's told you to do first now. Because if you're not faithful in what you're doing now, I guarantee you God will not call you for something bigger. If you're not faithful for, for what you're, uh, in, in the capacity that you're serving now, God will not lift you up into a higher service for Him. You are called to be a faithful servant. And this is something uh, that we realize here in the parable that Christ preached in Matthew 25. You are called to be faithful servants of the Lord. And Eleazar here is a faithful servant of Abraham that he chose him to do this very important mission. Remember, Abraham is old. He knows he's about to die. And God promised him something, that I will, uh, uh, I will bless you, I will bless the seed, your seed, Isaac. And un up until now, Sarah has, uh, 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 has died, Abraham is old, Isaac is still single. I'm about to die, where's the promise? He's not, maybe he's not even uh, uh, courting anyone. And where is this? We're in the land of strangers. We're in the land of Canaanites, ungodly people. So Isaac has no chance, maybe, to marry someone who's godly as well. So Abraham is, might be worried. Put your place in his position. God, I want to see the, the fulfillment of the promise. Maybe I will not see, uh, get, live to see all my grandchildren, but at least I get to see my son Isaac get married and at least see the fulfillment of that promise. So he said, this is very important. This may be the last chance. I'll call my most entrusted servant. Now, when God wants something done, He will call people who He can, he can trust. He will call people who have been faithfully ministering. Matthew chapter 25, verse 14, it says, As servants of God, For the kingdom of heaven is a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants, and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his uh, several ability and straightway took his journey. Now the talent here in this parable is literally money. Okay, talent is like the weight of the treasure that is given to you. Now, by, because since this is a parable, we can use it in a lot of principle. The talents, like literal talents that God is giving you, or even the resources, every resources that God is giving you. God has given us resources, and God is trying uh, is is uh, uh, just like this master is has given us. Uh, is expecting for us to use it for his glory. Now the Lord is, is uh, in the same way, the Lord is preparing a place for us. And when he left us here on earth and he went to heaven uh, to, to, to be with the Father, he gave us talents. Not, maybe not money, but he gave us resources to use here on earth. And one day he's going to return and going to ask of what we have done with those resources. Now God has given you ability. The verse says here, to every man, to his several ability. That's why you notice that not everyone has the same capabilities. Not everyone can stand here and preach. But not everyone can do what you can do. And there are things that you cannot do that others can do. Now that is the wisdom of God. He places together here, the Bible says in uh, Ephesians, fitly framed together. That means God has given us ability that my weakness someone can feel. Your weakness someone else can feel. And if we all do what we're supposed to do, we're going to glorify the Lord as a church. That's why God has given us, a, depending on your ability, verse 16, that he, then he had that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained another two. Now, we see, in the, we see these two faithful servants who have been given the most talents, they immediately obeyed their master, and they were able to make good use of the talents that God was given to them. The one who had been given more, yielded more. Like common sense. The one who is given less, yielded less when, when you judge it to amount. But if you put it into percentage, both of them did the same thing. Right? Both of them did what was expected of them to do. Now, that is the way uh, the Lord is going, is going to judge us. There are people, you know, who are great speakers, who can speak here, great orators, right? But 
even if they're great speakers, if they will not use it properly and they will trust their ability instead of God, they will not be used mightily by God. Now, some people may not be great speakers, but will rely on the power of the Holy Spirit and can preach a better message than people who are, great, who are better speakers. So, it's not about the ability. It's, it is, yes, it is about ability, but it's not, it's not the whole point. The whole point is, how are you using that? How are you entrusting God the ability? How are you giving God that talent that He has given you? Verse 18 says, But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and, his, and hid his Lord's money. There are servants who are lazy. There are servants who are faithful. And God will entrust more to them. But there are servants who are lazy. And I can tell you with 100% confidence that God will not call to serve Him and that God will not call someone who's lazy in this church someone who's not doing anything someone who's just sitting on his behind someone who's just a, a, a mere spectator someone who's not even involved in the ministry and then god will miraculously call to be a pastor that never happens it all it, it only means that maybe they're just uh, emotionally driven oh god is calling me to be a pastor i can tell you if you're lazy god's not calling you to be a pastor you're not even reading his word how can you be a pastor? You're not even studying His Word. How can you do that? God calls people who's faithfully doing His work and then will entrust them more. Verse number 19. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. We have to realize that God has given us resources and He is one day coming back to ask of what we have done of those resources. Our readiness uh, for Christ's coming depends on what we did of, of, on our, of our resources. Now, if I may ask you today, are you ready for Christ's coming? Are you going to answer, how are you going to answer Him how you use the resources He has given you? The time, the money, the talent, the ability that He's given you. Can we answer God with confidence that, Lord, I have used this for your glory faithfully? Now, only you can answer that. Verse 20 to 23. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. What did the Lord say? His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. The basis of God's reward is our goodness and what? faithfulness the uh, uh the the, the character uh, the criteria the by the, uh, the lord said well then the good and faithful servant that is the basis of our reward verse uh, next verse uh, he also that had received two talents came and said lord thou deliverest unto me two talents behold i have gained two other talents beside them his lord said unto him well thou the well done good and faithful servant thou hast been faithful over a few things I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Notice here that the person who yielded five and the person who yielded two received the same reward. Same reward. Why? Because they were both good and faithful. The way God will judge us someday is not about the amount uh, that the eyes can see. It's not about how big your church is. It's not about how many members you have. It's about how faithfully you carried about your mission. That's why for some reason, these verses are very clear, but for some reason, believers today wear the spectacles of the world and judge people or judge the work of God according to how the world wants to judge us. Right? They're only few. They're nothing. They're small. They're nothing. That is the thinking of the world. That is the way the world judge, judge, uh, judge uh, the work of God. But God, in His eyes, the way He judges, are you faithfully doing what I called you to do? Are you faithfully doing that? Because the Apostle Paul is clear, right? I have planted Apollos water. My job is to plant. His job is to water. It's not our job to, 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 uh, uh, to grow the ministry. It is the Lord who will give the increase. So God will judge you. Have you planted faithfully? Have you watered faithfully? No matter if you yielded much food or not, God will judge you your goodness and your faithfulness. Now this, the guy yielded five, the other one yielded two. They had the same reward. Now, look at the next verse. Uh, then he which he had received one talent uh, came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast sown and gathering where thou hast not strong. Now, another thing to notice here, as servants of God, we're going to be judged individually. Because if these three people were judged as a group, then basically they will all have their rewards. Because they were given uh, like uh, eight talents, and when the master came back, they all gave uh, back uh, 15. Yes. 
15 talents, right? So as a group, they will have the reward if they're judged as a group. Realize we're not going to be judged as a church. We're going to be judged individually. So this church can be glorifying the Lord. This church can do much here in the ministry, here, here, in, here in Cambodia. But if you individually did not contribute to that, you will not receive the same reward that people in this church will have someday. Realize that you're going to answer individually. Now this person who's lazy was uh, called by the master and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man. Reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast trod, and I was afraid, and went and hid the, and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast is, that is thine. His Lord. Uh, so look at this. Look at the words of this servant. He says, "Master, you have much. I know you. You're rich. You have a lot of things, and you give me one talent. Whatever I'll be able to do with this one talent will not make you even." will not uh, uh, affect your richness. You're still rich. Whether I, I gain another talent, it, it's just too little compared to your riches. Now, we can have that kind of attitude. God has given me only this ability. Right? Only given me this ability. And if I use this, it doesn't matter anyway. All I can do is clean. So, I will just, uh, not, because that's all the ability I have, I will be lazy. I will not clean anyway. All I can do is teach children. But others can preach in front of many people. Others can go to different countries and, and, and evangelize people. All I can do is this. Now, again, look at that. We can only have this attitude if we take upon ourselves responsibilities that were not given by God. Right? That's the reason why we compromise. That's the reason why we try to do something more than what God has called us to do. Why? Because we look at the amount of the talent the same way that the world is judging us in the, um, in the, in, in the amount that we're supposed to do. But if you realize that God has given you this and you're supposed to be faithful in this only, then you can give your best in doing that. And maybe someday God can give you more responsibility. So if God has given you that, that talent and in your eyes it's small, faithfully do that. Just faithfully do that. Do not think that, oh, this will not do any difference at all. You don't know. It will make all the difference in eternity because God will judge if you're faithful in doing that. It may not make a lot of difference here, but if, 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 it, if not for the people who clean this church, will not be comfortable today. Right? If not for the people who are cleaning downstairs, uh, maybe some of us will not feel like coming to a dirty auditorium. Right? But you may feel like you don't do much right now, but God is looking at your faithfulness. Remember, Faithfully plant, faithfully water, leave the result to God. It doesn't matter what kind of talent God is giving you. Now, you can have that ability. Now, look at this guy. He said, Lord, this is just little. So what I did was I hid it, and now it's still here. It's yours. At least he knows it belongs to God. Right? At least he's honest. But notice here that the, uh, the, uh, the attitude of a lazy person, he will find a way to blame others. And in this way, he blamed his master. You're rich. You don't need one talent. You're rich. I cannot do anything to make you happy because you have everything you have now. You, you, ha you have everything you can have right now. That's why he's blaming his master. Now for us, people who are lazy, to use our talents for God, to use our abilities for God, we always find a way to blame others. We always find a way to blame things in our lives. We always find a way to blame circumstances. We always find these excuses. And what we don't realize is ultimately we're blaming God. We're blaming God. Why? Because there's a Bible study. There's a Bible class. There is service. But Lord, I have a family. I need to take care of my baby. I need to take care of my wife. I need to take care of my husband. Lord, I have a job tomorrow. I need to wake up early. Bible study ends too late. I, cannot, I, I, I may be late for my job. I, I, I may get fired. Lord, I have all of these things. But do you realize it's the Lord who has given you all these things? So it is better if God didn't give you a job so you can do more for Him? Are you saying that it's better that God didn't give you a baby so that you can do more for Him? Are you saying that it's better that God didn't give you a family so you can do more for Him? Do not use God's blessings as an excuse not to serve Him. Do not use God's blessing as an excuse not to do more for Him. Why? Ultimately, you're blaming God. God, you've given me these things. I have to do this. But I can't, so that's why I cannot do that anymore. You're blaming your master. You're blaming the one who's given you. This guy, lazy guy, blamed his master 
mayaman ka naman na eh. Tinago ko na lang. At least, oh yan oh, ito pa rin. Hindi na wala. Now, at least he's honest. But when the Lord judged him, how did his master judge him? Verse 26, His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. Why was he punished? He's lazy. Lazy. Tamad. A lot of us do not realize that laziness is a real sin that we have to repent of. Why? He's not judged because of anything else but because he was lazy. That's the reason. I'm judging you and condemning you because you're lazy. He may not be an adulterer, but he's lazy. He may not be a liar because he's honest. I hid it under. Now I'm digging it up, giving it back to you, but you're lazy. Right? He may not be uh, all of these uh, things that we, we put on a pedestal, sins that we put on a pedestal and say these are big sins, but God said, you will have to be judged because you are lazy. Now, God has given us these abilities and you have to repent because laziness is a real sin. And if you're lazy to use your ability for God, and if you're lazy to, to enhance your ability for God, to use that for the glory of the Lord, that is a real sin that God will judge someday. Your laziness. That's why if you're a preacher, you're lazy to study the Bible, God will judge that. If you're a singer in the choir, you're lazy to study the songs, God will judge that because laziness is a real sin. Sometimes we don't realize that we are all in this room guilty of laziness. All of us, we're guilty of that. We don't feel like doing the things we are supposed to do. That is something everyone feels. But as we have studied yesterday, all of us will be tempted to be lazy. But it's up to us if we're going to give in or not. Most of the time, when I, I know I have to sit down on my table, I have to open my Bible, I have to study, but I'm lazy. Higa na lang ako. Right? Nonood na lang. Because that's what the flesh wants. And really, we're all guilty of that. Every day, we succumb to the temptation of laziness. Every day. Lahat po tayo. No one is exempted. And we can only ask the grace of God to give us that ability to be diligent in using our talents. Right? Kaya nga po, in, my, in the class that I'm teaching every Monday, I make sure that everyone will be opening their Bible every day and studying until the next class. Every single day. I want to make sure. Why? Because I want people to do the work that they have to do. Put in the work, open the Bible, read the Bible, study for themselves. Not just rely on the preacher, rely on the teacher. Study that. That's why I give them homework. I, I, for the whole week, starting Monday, all I heard was uh, complain. But I don't care. I'll give you more job to do. Why? Because there's no place for laziness in the church. No place. You have to study. You have to open it. Kaya nga, ang dami naman niya. May quiz na. May quiz na sa Monday. May quiz pa sa Wednesday. May quiz pa sa Sunday. Pag bumagsak pa sa Wednesday, nagbibigay pa ng $5. Ano ba naman niya? So what? You think what you're doing is already enough? Kulang pa nga yun eh. Right? You have to do more for God. You have to... Now, all of us, do you, do you realize that all of us have been given the responsibility? We have been entrusted the Word of God. We have been entrusted the Bible. And we have to be diligent in studying the Bible. But how many times are we guilty of being lazy to open our Bible and read? How many times are we guilty of being lazy to meditate upon the Word of God? How many times are we guilty of being lazy of studying the very words that God has given to us? That is something we have to repent of. And maybe repent of every day. I don't know if that's the correct uh, meaning that pastor is teaching you. But you repent of that laziness. I'm not saying that if you have repented now, you'll never be lazy anymore. You still succumb to it, but always realize that God is going to uh, judge us of our laziness as well. That's why if you're called to preach and we are lazy to study the Word of God, let's repent or quit preaching. If you are in the choir, you're lazy to study the song, repent or stop singing. Because you're wasting your time and God is going to judge you. And I'm not being uh, holier than thou here. I'm guilty of the things that I'm saying right now. I'm guilty of the very things that I'm preaching right now. And it's something that we have to realize. But what, what did uh, 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 realize that our attitude towards God is very lazy. Now, sabi ko nga, uh, last, yeah, last night we were uh, 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 reading posts and Pastor Jesse said that when it comes to these uh, uh, things, we let fear rule over us and then we do something more. I realized that when there's crisis, when there's things that we have to do, that the fear, if fear motivates us, we can do more than 
when love is motivating us. And that should be the other way around. Yeah, takot tayo sa coronavirus, we do a lot. We buy masks, we clean ourselves. Every time I go home after I go out, after from school, I always take a bath because I don't want my uh, child to get sick, whatever. Kaya nga si Tita Vicky, ganun din ang ginagawa ay nagkasakit, nagkasipon. Kasi ligo ng ligo. Why? Kasi syempre kailangan eh. Kaso nga lang, na-realize natin, we have to realize because when fear motivates us, we do more. But we say what we love God, but we do less because of that love for God. Right? How many of us entered this door after 9 o'clock? Right? Our Sunday school is 9. But how many of us entered at 9.01? What time is our prayer breakfast every Saturday? 9. How many of us arrive at 9.30? 9.45. Right? What time is your class tomorrow? 8. I guarantee you no one will be late tomorrow for class. Think about that for a moment. No one will be late tomorrow for class. But, it's, but for you, it's okay to be late in, in, in church. What is the attitude of a servant? Is that the kind of attitude a servant has to have towards his master? Right? I, I'm saying, again, all of us, guilty. Like, if we have class, we set the alarm earlier than for Sunday. Right? Pagka may class, mas nagbamadali tayo kaysa paglinggo. Right? That is the normal, uh, that is the natural thing that our flesh wants, and we succumb to that. Right? Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming, I should have received mine with uh, own usury. So basically, the master is saying, Itatago mo na rin lang pala. Why didn't you just hide it in the bank? At least it gained a little interest. Instead of hiding it under the earth, where it gained nothing. Right? So use your brain. Mag-isip ka naman. Yun ang sinasabi ng master sa kanya. Sa katamaran mo, hindi ka na nag-isip. Uh, 28 to 29. Uh, pa? <laughs> Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath ten talents. Right? You, we have to realize that if you are lazy, God will not always strive with our laziness. Someday, God will take away that uh, uh, privilege for you to serve him. You keep on letting it pass by. We keep on letting it, uh, 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 letting laziness uh, kill, uh, uh, defeat us. God will someday say, hey, I will not give you that opportunity anymore. Give it to someone else. For unto everyone that hath shall be given, and that he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away, even that which he hath. So let's not get to thinking that we always have the chance to serve the Lord. Right? God will someday take it away, away from us. So Abraham chose the entrusted servant. Now, if you want God to call you and trust you something that is very important in the ministry, you have to be sure that you're faithful in the little things first before God gives you the, uh, the, the uh, uh, bigger things. Remember, when the Holy Spirit called Paul and Barnabas, He called people who are doing something, who are the best people in the church. He will not call people who are just sitting on their backs. Sitting on, uh, lying on their back, sitting on their behinds, and then magically call you to oh, Istanbul and, and be a missionary. That doesn't happen. Be faithful. So Abraham knows the, uh, the importance of this, and he gave it to his most entrusted servant. Now, what is the reason? Second point, what is the reason for the mission? The verse 3 and 4 in Genesis 24 says, And I will make thee swear by the Lord God, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, about whom I dwell, but thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Asaph. We have to realize that the reason for this is Abraham knows the curse of an equal yoke. He knows that the curse. Now he knows that God will fulfill his promise, but he knows for a fact that God will not fulfill his promise through uh, 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 an unbelieving wife for Isaac. He knows that. What we don't realize is in the old na, na, that the, the uh, unequal yoke has been seen greater in the Old Testament than in the New Testament. God has given us more examples of how God curses unequal yoke. It started with uh, here in the book of Genesis, and, and we'll study this tomorrow in our uh, class, but let's try to uh, talk about it anyway. We have to realize that when the, uh, the sons of God uh, uh, took wives unto themselves the sons of men now, now the daughters of men there, there, there are a lot of interpretations son of God maybe the uh, 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 godly line of Seth maybe a fallen angels or maybe even just possessed people possessed by the evil spirit but no matter what the interpretation is we can never be sure but no matter what the interpretation is the principle is this an unequal yoke will be cursed by God 
They're not supposed to marry each other. They're not supposed to have kids. And God cursed them. And because of that, the, the, uh, the, the human race became wicked, more wicked and more wicked. Realize that wickedness always comes in the Old Testament from an equal yoke. When Israel always gets for, uh, for themselves wives that are heathen wives, it is something that God gives, uh, give, they give God reason to curse them. It's always that. Whenever even the wisest man to ever live there in the Old Testament, his downfall is an equal yoke. Why? We have to realize God curses that. And Abraham knows that. That's why he said, please go back there. Find a, purse, a, a woman of God, a, a, a daughter of God, and give that to my, to my son because I don't want him to marry any Canaanites. Rem, uh, re, uh, remember that Abraham is living there in Canaan. It's okay for him to live with them, but do not marry them. Do not marry them. Do not be an equal yoke. And the, an equal yoke is not just about romantic relationships. Even in our business, be careful who we come into business with. If the people or unbelievers that we are in business with are the ones drawing us far away from God, God is cursing that relationship. Let go of it. Right? If, if, if your friendship, even your friendship, if they're pulling you away from God, that is God cursing that relationship. Let go of it. And maybe the reason why we're not being fully blessed by God is because we're not letting go of any unequal yoke in our life. It may not be a husband, it may not be a boyfriend, it may not be a girlfriend, but it is someone who is drawing you, pulling you away from God. You know what it is. It may not even be a person. It may be something you like that is of this world and it's pulling you away from God. That is an unequal yoke. Get rid of it. Let go of it. Why? Because we have to realize that there is a curse for the unequal yoke. God has been consistent with that standard from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Do not. There is no compromise, no exemption. The Bible says do not. Now, let's go to uh, point number three in verse number five. And the servant said unto him, Peradventure, the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I need to bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? Point three here, service, serving God, has its difficulties, and we will be tempted to compromise. Has its difficulties. Now, what is his job? To go to a, uh, to a place, call a wife for Isaac. Our job, to preach the gospel, and, and in a sense, we're in a different place. We're in Cambodia, this is not our country. We're here to preach the gospel, and you know the difficulties we have here. What do you have to do? Go to the village, you preach. Right? Uh, what, what, what did, what did uh, the servant say? What if it, the w woman will not believe me? Should I just come back here, take Isaac, and bring him there so that he can choose for himself? Why? Because his question is legitimate. Why? Imagine, from here, I will go to that place. Okay? Nobody knows who Abraham is. Uh, I can tell them what kind, of what kind of riches Abraham has, but they may not believe me. Right? And then I will find a wife whom I do not know. I will find a stranger, a woman, and I will approach the woman and say, can you come with me and marry my master? I haven't, she haven't even seen him. She, haven't even, uh, she doesn't even know who Isaac is. But by faith, I have to go and tell her, please marry my master. Go with me. No one here in their right minds will do that. If someone will come here and say, uh, are you single? Yes, come, come, with me to, come with me to the Middle East. Uh, marry my master. Oh, I will willingly come. No, it's, the, the question is legitimate. If he doesn't ask, he's a little bit of a topic. But tama yung tanong niya eh. Mahirap ang pinapagawa. And it's the same thing with us. Mahirap ang pinapagawa sa atin ng Panginoon. We're going to a country where people do not even know the God we're preaching. We're going to a place where people don't even recognize the authority of the Bible we're using. We're going to a place where people have their own God. Have their own idols. We have to realize Cambodia is the stronghold of the devil. We have to destroy a lot of things. You have to go to the village and teach them about the Bible. You have to go to the village and teach them about God. That there's only one true God. That all the gods that they're, they're, they're uh, serving is not the true God. They have to repent. And even then, you spend years and years teaching them only one word from their parents to stop. They will stop. It's difficult. It has its challenges. And you will be tempted to what? Compromise. What did, the, uh, what did the servant say? Should I just bring Isaac there? It's better if Isaac is good looking, it's easier to tell the marry him. Oh sure, marry him, he's handsome. And he's, uh, he has a lot of gold, he's rich. I'll marry him. 
but it's completely different. I don't, there's no photo, photograph during those times. He can't take a picture. Here's my master, marry him, he's handsome. No, you just say he can just describe his mighty, his rich. You know, Abraham is a rich guy in the desert and all these things. You have to marry him, you'll be rich. They will not believe you. It is very, it is, it's a very legitimate. Now, he said, can I just bring, that is the compromise the servant is, uh, is uh, 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 offering Abraham. I'll just bring him. But Abraham knows God, that God said, leave the land of the Chaldeans and go to a place where I will lead you and do not leave there. Why? I will bless you there. So Abraham said, don't do that. Don't ever bring Isaac back. Why? Because God promised me that I, he will bless me here. We will not leave this place. That is God's word. That is God's promise. Do not compromise. Now, we can be tempted to compromise. What is the temptation? Can we just change our music a little bit so that we can attract them to come? Can we just water down the gospel a little bit so that they will believe it more? It's easier for them to accept. Can we just forego repentance? Because that's harder to teach. Can we just lead them to a prayer and then believe that they're saved? These are the compromises that God or the devil will offer you. Do not give in to that. And if you do not know your Bible, it's easy to compromise. Why did Abraham say no? Because he knows the word of God. He knows God's promise. He knows what God told him. This is what God told me. I will stay here and I will stay here no matter what. Even if you go there and will not be able to find a wife for Isaac, God will use another way to fulfill that promise. But I will not compromise what he told me to do. And it's easy for us to compromise. Why? Because we don't know the Bible. That's why those people who we, we condemn for easy believism, it's, it's baffling them. Why are you condemning us? You're, you're, you're being an enemy of the gospel. Uh, are you not happy that these people are saved? They pray the prayer? For them, it's mind-boggling. Why are they saying that? Why? Because they don't know the Bible. They know. I guarantee you if they know, they understand what we're saying. But they don't understand. Why? Because they don't know the Bible. Abraham knows the Bible, said no compromise. If you don't know the Bible, it's easy to compromise. Right? What, what if we just change our music a little bit? Right? I just get music that will get them to dance a little bit. It, there's nothing wrong in the Bible. The Bible didn't say that. Are they even dancing in the Old Testament, right? We can dance. We can bring more people in for the sake of the gospel. Right? Or what if we just forgo repentance? The Bible says just believe, right? Just believe. So just preach them belief. Don't preach repentance anymore. Because that is something that's harder to swallow. And I don't even want to spend the time to study and teach that. Right? Because they don't know the Bible. That's why they can compromise. That's, uh, we are tempted to compromise because we don't know what we're supposed to do. But if you know your Bible and you know what God wants you to do and you know and you have knowledge of the scripture, you will never compromise if you place your faith in that so isaac said uh, abraham said no never bring that if you cannot find a wife then you are free from this oath but never bring isaac back to that place god doesn't want that to happen and god will find another way if you cannot find a wife for my for my son so and which brings me to the next point um, maybe the last point for today knowledge must precede service right verse 9 it says after the servant asked, verse 9, he said, And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swear to him concerning that matter. Now, he agreed to do it, but not after he asked what he's supposed to do. He asked, Paano pa ganito? Paano pa ganyan? Anong gagawin ko? Now, when he was clear, when he was clear about his job, then he swear, I'm going to do this. And we will see later on that he did everything he can to fulfill that. But, that only happened because he knows what he has to do. Right? That's why knowledge must precede service. This is the reason why people think they're called of God, but not really. Yeah. Why? Because they don't know the Bible. How do you know if God is calling you? First, a calling from God will not contradict the Bible. Never contradict the Bible. Something, if you say, if you feel like God is doing, let, asking you to do something and it's contradict to the scripture, I guarantee you it's not God who's telling you to, to do that. Right? Oh, uh, Lord, should I take this job? But I'm going to miss this, I'm going to miss that. It's not God's will for you. Right? Lord, should I go to this place but there's no church? God, do you have to ask, ask that question, really? Lord, is it your will for me to go to a place where there's no church? It's contrary to the scripture. That is not a calling from God. Kala mo lang yun. Guni guni mo lang yun. Maligo ka lang. Wala na yung calling. Right? Uh, next, a calling from God is accompanied by equipping. Right? 
when God, yes, God calls the weak things, the base things of this world, the people who are foolish in the sight of the world, and you may be weak, you may be no one, you may be nobody, but when God calls you, be sure that He will equip you. He will tell you, He will give you, God will not tell you to do something that He will not help you to do it. That makes Him a very, uh, a very cruel God. He will call you, you may be nobody, but He will give you the necessary resources for you to be able to do that. So God's calling is accompanied by equipping. A calling for God will always result in His glory. If, if God is calling you to do something, and you see that this something is only for your benefit, then it's not God calling you. Yes, God's calling will benefit you, but it will ultimately point to His glory. Right? God is not calling you for your comfort. God is not calling you for your convenience. And most of the time, the calling of God is not comfortable. It's not convenient. Requires you to leave something you don't want to leave. But if it, that is for His glory, it is a calling from God. And if you are sure that God is the one calling you, what's next? You're going to be equipped. How? By the Word of God. That's why knowledge has to precede service. Alamin mo muna yung gagawin mo bago ka gumawa. Alamin mo muna kung papaano bago mo gawin. Why? You're not, you don't have to go in there blind. But the Holy Spirit is not magic. I know nothing of the Word of God, but I'm called to preach. When I stand, the Holy Spirit will tell me what to say. It doesn't work that way. You have to study. And you have to do it. And the Holy Spirit will use that. God will equip you. That's why I always say, knowledge has to precede service. What does 2 Timothy 3, 16 7 to 17 say? All scripture, the Bible, the one that we have, is given by inspiration of God. These are the very words of, words of God. The one who created the world, the one who has saved you. This is His word. It's given by Him, inspired by Him. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. What? That the man of God, you and me, may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, to be equipped, to tell us what to do. To do what? To do all and to all good works. So before you even go and fulfill the calling of God, make sure you know what to do. Make sure you do whatever you can to study and to know what God is specifically telling you what to do. Now, there comes a time that you have to immediately obey the Lord. But it doesn't mean that you have to forego the, having the knowledge of the Word of God. All of us need to have that. Kailangan po natin. That's why I'm, that's why I'm saying... Sunday Bible class, Monday class, Wednesday class, it's not even enough. It's not enough. If you still have time at your house, study the Bible, read the Bible. Now, there, there comes a time, you know, if it's wonderful. If you let the Lord lead you to what you have to study, what you have to read, it's wonderful how the Holy Spirit works. Sometimes I sit down at my table, I don't have any plan what to read at all. Sometimes I watch, I watch uh, YouTube videos. Uh, you know, you know when YouTube videos. Even, even coming to this message today, para bang yung nalun, yung pagnalunod ka na sa YouTube, nagsimula ka lang nanood ka lang ng kobi, but the holy kono nung pinapanood mo, dahil sinusundan mo yung mga link na suggestion, right? That is what happens when you when you lose yourself in reading. Like this is something that God, the Lord led me to by just reading random stuff, right? The Lord will lead. Now, well, it's wonderful when you let the Lord do that, equip you, teach you, lead you. It's wonderful that you will see that your calling will be clearer. Bakit? Mas alam mo. Your calling will be clear. You think God is calling you to be a pastor? Study the Word of God. Then you, it, will, it will be clearer what kind of pastor you have to be. How you have to lead the people of God. How you have to feed them the Word of God. How you have to go about leading the congregation of the Lord. Without that knowledge, you will just make a mess of the ministry. You'll make a mess of the ministry. Kaya marami naliligaw, kaya marami kung ano nung tinuturo. Why? Because they took for granted the knowledge that they need to have before they serve the Lord. Took it for granted. They think that desire enough is, uh, is okay. They think that the uh, good intentions are good enough. They think that uh, uh, to shout behind the pulpit is good enough. They think that to recycle the preaching of other preachers are good enough. That's not good enough. You have to be led by the Lord and you have to do that by studying the Word of God. The servant said, the servant asked, what if do this? What if this will happen? I'm sure there's some other things that he asked before he said, okay, I agree, I'll do it. Now, before you say yes, uh, you say yes, but before you go, make sure that you know what you're doing, the knowledge of the Word of God. In conclusion here, we're all servants of God. All of us are called to evangelize, to preach the gospel, but we are called to do something more specific for the Lord. Only you knows that. 
But make sure and, and realize that lazy servants will not be entrusted more. If you want to be entrusted more, be faithful with the little that God has entrusted you. Laziness is a real sin that we have to repent of and that we are all guilty of this. And it's time that we have the right attitude towards God and His ministry. And we will, then only then will we be clearer in our calling and we will know what to do for the Lord. And we will be used mightily by the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning that we have uh, studied uh, these few verses. I pray that you help us see the point. And even, if, even as we uh, later as we leave,